Uh, there are many days that I get up, and what I find is um, I'm a little confused as to why God uses me for anything. I don't know. I'm, I'm going to say there are days that, uh, that my, my success rate is not very high. There are days that, we'll just, we'll just talk about even getting up in the morning. You know, I say, tomorrow I'm going to get up at 6 o'clock in the morning. And 6 o'clock rolls around, and I'm like, I really don't want to get up at 6 o'clock in the morning. Maybe 6.15 will feel better. Maybe 6.30 will feel better. I don't know. And then when you finally get up, you're mad about it, and you're like, I just don't even want to be up. I mean, that's, you know. You're like, I've got to go out, and I've got to smile, and I've got to be nice to people. But today, I just kind of want to be in bed. And now, there's days like that for me, even parenting. In parenting, I would love to say that I, I make the right choices all the time. I don't. I would love to say that I'm a good father every day. I'm not. I would like to say that I'm a good man every day and I, I prove over and over and over again that oftentimes I go with my, my weaker parts and my, not my stronger parts. That I, that I go with the, the bad, well, unfortunately, maybe they are the stronger part, parts because they're the bad things, the bad habits, the bad whatever that I fall into. There's a lot of times. I mean, there's a lot of times that when I get out of bed, I look and I go, obviously today is not a day God could use me because I'm not in, in my, my best frame of mind. I'm not in my best physical sense. I'm not. There's a lot of reasons God ought not be able to use me. There's a lot of reasons. Maybe, I'm, maybe if I had, I know a lot of people who have said things like this, and I don't know, maybe too. If, if only I had... Uh, if I had a lot of money, the first thing I would do is I, you know, if I won the lottery, I'm not saying anybody in here plays the lottery, but if I won the lottery, what would you do? Oh, I would have, I would have a lottery, I'd pay off my house, I'd do this, and then I'd go on a mission to somewhere. I would go and do something for God, because now I got all this money, right? I'd give a bunch to the church, and then I'd go and do this other thing. There's so many things that we turn around and, and we say these other things. You know, if I, if I, maybe if I was more better, if I was more well off, I would be able to serve God better. I can't serve God better right now because I'm working so hard to, to pay these bills. Or maybe if I just went to school and learned about God, I would know more about God. Or maybe if I, you know, maybe my job's not such that people would find it anything that I have to say about God valuable. Or maybe my family is not such that people would find it. Or maybe my history is not such. There's a lot of reasons when we come in, we find a lot of reasons that maybe God can't use us. Our background, our history. Our parentage. All those things. And when I look at uh, our, our message today out of Mark, I see that, that these, uh, these doubts and fears, they're not common. Or they're not uncommon. As a matter of fact, it's not even something I can blame on the current culture. They seem to transcend cultures. And we'll do this. Let's go ahead and open our Bibles to Mark chapter 6. We're going to start right on out here. Mark chapter 6, this is the NLT version, the New Living Translation. Jesus left that part of the country and returned with his disciples to Nazareth, his hometown. The next Sabbath, he began teaching in the synagogues, and many who heard him were amazed. They asked, where did he get all this wisdom and the power to perform such miracles? Now let me pause for a second. When, I, when we read amazed, so often in America, we think amazed sounds fantastic, right? Amazed literally means that it's something that we don't expect. It doesn't match our expectations. Oftentimes when we say it, we, we have, a, we have a, a, a feeling that when I say amazed, that I get something better than I expect. Well, this just means something different than they expect. So, they, so there's no, con, there's no, there's not a switch of gears here. So you see that they're amazed, and then a second later it says they scoffed. They're amazed, in other words, they saw something that didn't match what they expected. So what did they do instead of rejoicing in it? They, they scoffed. So picking up where we, uh, picking up right there, it says, then they scoffed. He's just a carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, uh, Joseph, uh, Judas, and Simon. And his sisters live here right among us. 
They were deeply offended and refused to believe him. They were offended. So something unexpected happens. They scoff at it and they turn around being offended at it. What were they? It was the teaching. The teaching that he had. The healing that he had. He was doing all these amazing things. Amazing in the sense that they didn't expect it. They weren't run of the mill. He wasn't making a table. He wasn't building a, a house, which is what a carpenter's son ought to do. He was changing lives. He was driving out demons. Well, that doesn't. I mean, he should be able to make a square cut on a piece of wood, but driving out a demon? Where does that training come from? They looked at all of this, continuing on. Then Jesus told them a prophet is honored everywhere except in his hometown and among his relatives and his own family. And because of their unbelief, he couldn't do any miracles among them except by placing hands on a few sick people and healing them. He was amazed at their unbelief. Now the first thing I want to talk about this is I think this is an important thing to see. It said that there were no miracles, in other words, great works. Only laying on hands of people and healing them. So people were getting physically healed. So things that we'd often say were miracles. But the great work that, that God was looking for was changed lives, not changed bodies. So the miracles that weren't happening was conversions. Conversions to follow Christ. He was changing their physical body, but he wasn't changing who they were, their identity, their affiliation. They were headed to hell in a much healthier body. They came to him only for a miracle, for a healing, and that's all they got. Now, so the first thing is to talk about when God looks at things that are miracles. The miraculous is not the, the uh, for, for God, is not something as simple as fixing a broken body. A miracle for God is a change in eternal destination. A change in who we were before and suddenly we're a new people, person made in Christ. That is much bigger so we see he has, they had a list, right? This, this was the list that they gave him that they said, this is why you cannot be a minister, right? They, they gave it. They said, listen, listen, you should be a carpenter, right? You're the son of carpenter, you got to be a carpenter. You're a tradesman. You're not a professional. You're not a scholar. You didn't go to school. We know where you came from. You came from that house over there on the left. That's where you're at. For you to be something amazing, you would have had to come from somewhere else. You know, maybe the king's family or something. Had you been part of the king's family, then maybe. Well, I know that, that your great, 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 great grandfather happened to be the king's family, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about now. Now you're a tradesman, you're, right? Isn't that kind of what's going on here? They know their family, their history. This is all things. And you know what? I look at myself. I'm like, you know what? I didn't come from anywhere special. I didn't do anything special. <laughs> so sometimes we look at those people and we're like, man, one guy was an amazing evangelist. Really? Yeah, he came out of, he was a gang member, right? He shot 12 people, right? Then he went to prison and God found him. And now he comes out. Now that guy, he's got a testimony. Kind of a weird way that we do that, right? Isn't that weird that we do that? We, we look at him, oh, he was a hitman for 12 years and then gave his life to Christ. He's a good evangelist. What am I? Well, I could, well, these were all the excuses that they were saying that they couldn't take Jesus. Now, what's funny is I think in the account, so first of all, they tell Jesus why he can't do it because of all his background. So what is his response? Well, let's see what the next thing. Then Jesus went from village to village teaching people, and he called the 12 who were what? Fishermen, tax collectors, all kinds of random people that ought not have also 
been messengers of God. So what he did is he go, oh, yeah, carpenter. Well, how about a, a fish, fisherman or this? He trains these people and sends them out. I think that's fantastic. I, in my head, that's how I'm like, ha ha. And so he does. He passes the ministry on to more people that wouldn't be who they expected. And he, so he got, uh, he called his 12 disciples together and he began sending them out two by two, giving them authority to cast out evil spirits. He told them to take nothing uh, for the journey except a walking stick, no food, no traveling money, no clothes. Think about that. There's no, there's no soup kitchen. There's no anything. He's just saying, go. Amazing that they went, right? Two by two, they went. He allowed them to wear sandals, but to, take, uh, to not take a change of clothes. Wherever you go, he says, stay in the same house until you leave the town. But in any place, if any place refuses to welcome you or listen to you, shake its dust from your heels. Uh, as you leave to show that you have abandoned those people to their fate. So the dis disciples went out, telling everyone uh, they met to repent of their sins, turn to God. And they cast out many demons and healed many sick, anointed them with oil. Now this is neat. This is amazing things. Because here's what's, what's doing. First of all, their teaching is essentially the same as John the Baptist's te teaching. Because what are they saying? Repent, turn to God. Mm. They don't know a lot. But what they have, they're willing to give. Right? And, and Jesus is teaching them in this. Because he's teaching them to have faith. So here's what's happening. is, is he's, he's sent them out there. And i got to tell you this. They weren't really prepared. Not only did they not, not really prepared intellectually, they, he, they just went. He said, go. because oh, And they went because he told them to. Now they're, they're teaching this. Uh, they're teaching what they know, but they're doing more than that because now they're casting out demons and healing. Now here's the amazing thing. The things that they charged with Jesus is they said, hey, by what authority is he making these, well, his own authority? How are you casting out demons? Well, not only does Jesus cast out demons, he now teaches his disciples how to do it. Not only is he healing, but he tells his disciples to. Because here's the deal. Christ, from the very beginning, is making the church an active thing. An active organism. Christianity is an active faith. It's not a place for us all to come in and, and talk deep theological truth and scratch our, our beards and smoke our pipes and then go about the world unchanged. It's where we come together and we discuss who Christ is and we look at what Christ did and we pick that up and we, 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 we connect with us and we're empowered by the Holy Spirit we go out into the world changed. It's active. It's hard to, uh, it's hard to do Christianity on our, on our spiritual tokens. On, on our, you know, we can't, we got to be out moving. Got to be out moving and doing Ministering. I put there the e towel lesson. That was a, an amazing. There's a many. Uh, there's a neat video. I've talked about it before. Uh, e towel is a uh, video done by New Tribes Mission, where they kind of show this family that, that goes to. I think it's Indonesia. They work with an unreached people group. Uh, they uh, they do Bible storying. They tell the story about Christ. And, but they do it in this kind of neat, slow re reveal. So they tell the history of the world from the beginning all the way up to the crucifixion and the resurrection. And then that's when they do their altar call. But they tell it like week after week after week. So they, they spend weeks leading up to it. So that, and there's, this is a, a pre-industrial civilization. So they have no other place to do. They all come together and do this. So when they finally come and make that altar call, if you will, say, hey, do you want to be a Christian? The whole town, the whole village says, that's what we want. Right? And they get all excited. They have a huge party. And they look at the missionaries and they say, now what? And the missionary goes, now you go. And that was it. It was quick. It, it, they go straight from convert to going out and, and doing stuff. 
It's amazing. Because first of all, they knew all. They, they had been told everything up to there. They were ready to go. These folks, the, the disciples, were ready to go. They were ready to go and talk. And, and it says, now they weren't, they weren't ready to be deep theologians yet. How do I know that? Well, in Mark, the profession where they finally out their mouths say, hey, you are the Christ, doesn't happen until chapter 8. This is before they even clearly know who Jesus is. So, I like this. I think it's the he tell lesson, because really quick, Jesus is like, okay, you're on fire for me, I want to get you busy. Get you out there doing stuff. Now the thing is, when we look at the disciples, we realize that that list that I said, the good reasons I can't be at my job, my training, my, where I come from, my family history, all of that sort of stuff, none of that is really a barrier to ministry for Christ. None of it. I don't care where you're at. God will take you where you are. I'm stealing somebody's, you know, God, God doesn't call the equipped, he equips the call, right, isn't it? Somebody else's phrase but that's the truth. He goes, and I got a mission for you right now. Boom. Only my house was better. I'd have a home group, but, you know, we don't have a big enough kitchen. If only had a bigger kitchen. No. It's not about that. It's about now. Go. Move. Continue to read on. Now, I wanted to start really quick because he inserts, he inserts the story of John the Baptist. Now, there's a similarity with where the the disciples are intellectually, they're about where John the Baptist followers are. They're not quite to Christ followers, but, but except Christ is empowering them. So we look right here, it says, uh, so continuing, that's why we see the John the Baptist uh, account is in the middle here. It says, Herod Antipas, the king, who certainly heard about Jesus because everyone was talking about him. So when he, what he's done is he's now transformed everything. He's now passed ministry on to his disciples. His disciples are going around driving demons out, changing the world, and, the, the echo, and it's echoing in the palace of kings. So Herod Antipas, the king, soon heard about Jesus because everyone was talking about him. Some were saying, this must be John the Baptist raised from the dead. That is why he still can do such miracles. Others said he's the prophet Elijah. Still others said he's a prophet like the other great prophets of the past. Then Herod heard about Jesus, and he said, John, the man that beheaded has come back from the dead. Herod was affected by that. Now, Herod is an interesting person, because Herod, right here in the statement, believes that John was the prophet of God, and he was a powerful man of God, and he even had the ability to come back from dead, to what Herod's thinking. He thought all of that, but he still beheaded the guy. Isn't that weird? Well, let's, let's uh, look a little bit more. For Herod had sent soldiers to arrest and imprison John as a favor to Herodotus. She had been his brother Philip's wife, but Herod had married her. John had been telling Herod, it's against God's law for you to marry your brother's wife. So Herodotus bore a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. But without Herod's approval, she was powerless, for Herod respected John. And knowing that he was a good and holy man, he protected him. Herod was greatly disturbed when he talked with John, but even so, he liked to listen to him. Herod has his chance finally came on Herod's birthday. He gave a party for his high government officials, army officers, and the leading citizens of Galilee. Then his daughter, also named Herodotus, came in and performed a dance that greatly pleased Herod and his guest. Ask me for anything you like, the king said to the girl, and I will give you, he even bowed, I will give you whatever you ask up to half my kingdom. She went out and asked her mother, what should I ask for? Her mother told her, uh, ask for the head of John the Baptist. So the girl... <laughs> this is the first time you've heard this, I think. No, it's not. <laughs> so, the girl hurried back to the king and told him, I want the head of John the Baptist right now on a tray. Then the king deeply regretted what he had said, but because of his vows, he made 
in front of his guests, he couldn't refuse her. So he immediately sent an executioner to the prison to cut off John's head and bring it to him. And the soldier beheaded John in the prison, brought the head on a tray, and gave it to a girl uh, who took it to her mother. When John's disciples heard what had happened, they came to get his, his body and buried it in the tomb. So we see right here, I, it's, a, it's a really sad story because we see that by saving faith, he really cost him his soul. I mean, think about it. He was like, gosh, I can't let this vow go down. I might as well murder this prophet who I know is a prophet. Don't we? Don't we kind of do that? We do. There's a lot of times that we do something that's almost as crazy. There's a lot of times in our life that we recognize God's power to change or do amazing things, but we're like, well, we're not going to ask him of it right now because we're busy doing something else. That's the same kind of thinking. That's why Herod had John the Baptist in the kingdom, or in his kingdom. He liked listening to him. And someday I'll actually follow him. But it's, that's later. That's like people that say, you know, someday I'll be a Christian. I just don't want to do I want to get my oats out. I want to sow my oats first. That's kind of the whole deal. Well, he kind of came to that point where he had to make a choice. And he's like, well, I don't want to let, you know, anybody think less of me. There's a couple reasons I believe that Mark tucks this story in amongst the larger account. It's another kind of sandwich that he's done here. One of them is the fact that there's a similarity in the disciples. So what the disciples are teaching are about where John the Baptist's disciples are teaching. But it's more than that. We see that what they said about Jesus was he can't be the messenger of God because he's not, he didn't come from the palace. He didn't come from the background. Well, right here we see somebody that did come from the background that they would have accepted. Those people were looking for Herod Antipas to be the Christ. Had Herod come into Nazareth and done the th things Jesus did, they would have said yes, because he's got the right dread. He's got the right training, he's got the right background, he's got the right family. But we see the person that was in the position, that was in the seat that they thought was the right seat. He didn't have the faith. He didn't have the faith to even... When it came to personal humiliation versus doing the right thing, he chose, well, I can't do the right thing. I don't want to be humiliated. What will my guests at my talk party think? So that little interlude, that, that interlude pauses and it comes back and says, Then the apostles returned to Jesus from the ministry tour and told him all that they had done and taught. And Jesus said, uh, Let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. He said this because there were so many people coming and going that Jesus and his, and his apostles didn't even have time to eat. So they left by boat for a quiet place. There they could be alone. But many people recognized them and saw them leaving. And the people from many towns ran ahead along the shore and got ahead of them. And Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat. And he had compassion on them because they were like a sheep without a shepherd. And he began teaching them many things. Now, sheep without a shepherd is a reference also to numbers, uh, reference in, in numbers. But there's, there's more than that. I mean, basically, he looks at these people and he says, what they need is they need people teaching them and feeding them, right? Feeding them spiritually. He's already helping it out. What he's doing is by the church is there for that. That's what he's doing. He's... he's equipping the disciples to go out and do that sort of thing. Those are the shepherds that are going to be out there helping. <coughs> so we see right after this, we come up. Late in the afternoon, his disciples came out and said to him, this is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so that they can get, uh, so that they can go to nearby farms and villages and buy something to eat. Jesus said, you feed them. Wait a second. Let me pause for a second. Remember, what did the disciples take with them when they were serving God? Nothing. Nothing. What did these people take with them when they came out? And, I don't know. They may not have anything. Well, now listen, the disciples didn't die when they went out and did God's work, right? Because God provided for them. That was the lesson Jesus was trying to teach them. By not having anything and going out there, they had to rely on faith that God was going to feed them along the way. 
Kind of like the manna in the wilderness. These people are in the desert. There's a whole bunch of people out there. And suddenly the disciples are like, well, God can't feed this many people. What was the lesson I just tried to teach you? By two by two, I taught you. In two, if God can feed two people, God can feed 5,000 people. It's no difference to God. 60 million. 60 million people. He can fill up, feed, whatever. It's no difference. And, and, he's, and that's the thing. But their answer is with what? They ask him. We have to work for months to earn enough money to buy food for all these people. So then Jesus does the lesson again. He turns around and he says, how much bread do you have? Go and find out. They came back and reported, we have five loaves of bread and two fish. Is that enough to feed people? Is that enough to feed 5,000 people? No. Can God, God do it? Yes. Can people do it? No. no. But here's the deal. That whole lesson, that whole teaching that's happening, God is giving him. Listen, the people needed to be fed. They needed to be fed physically, but more so they needed to be taught. They needed to have teachers and leaders and all that. When Jesus said, this is a people without a shepherd, they need shepherds. That's who the disciples are. So this feeding the 5,000 is a picture of it, because watch what Jesus does. Uh, then Jesus told the disciples to have the people sit down in groups of, on the green grass, and he gave them in groups of 50 and 100, which is, by the way, the same kind of groups that, that, that God broke up the people in when he put leaders out there, the leaders of the 50s and 50s. He's doing the same kind of thing. He's, he's sending leaders out. He's, he's building up kind of little churches, if you will, and he's giving that picture. And it's more than just for the organization of feeding, because Jesus took the five loaves of bread, he took it, he put it toward heaven, blessed them, and then breaking it into pieces, he kept giving the bread to the disciples so that they could distribute it to the people. It's a picture not only of feeding here, it's a picture of teaching. He's giving it to the disciples, just like he did at the beginning of the chapter, right? I taught them a little bit, I gave it to them, and what they do? They went out into the villages. It's the same kind of teaching. He divided the fish. Uh, he divided the fish for everyone to share. They all ate as much as they wanted. And afterwards, the disciples picked up twelve baskets of leftover bread and fish, and a total of five thousand uh, men and their families were fed. Here's the deal: it is when I said it was manna, it was manna like in the wilderness, but more so because manna in the wilderness they just had enough for that day. In this, it's saying with, with Christ, there's an overabundance. It's superior to the manna solution. They come back with buckets full. But it's a picture of church in action. Jesus gives to me, I give to you, you give to other people. We continue to give it out. We continue to move out. That's how it goes. Isn't that amazing? Now, immediately after this, Jesus insisted that the twelve get back into the boat and head across the lake to Bethsaida. While he sent the people home, after telling everybody goodbye, he went up, up into the hills by himself to pray. Late at the night, the disciples were in the boat in the middle of the lake. Jesus was alone on the land. He saw that they were in serious trouble, rowing hard and struggling against the wind and waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them, walking on water. He intended to go past them. But when they saw him walking on water, they cried out in terror, thinking he was a ghost. They were all terrified when they saw him. But Jesus spoke to them at once, Do, uh, don't be afraid and take courage, I am here. Then he climbed into the boat and the wind stopped. They were totally amazed and they still didn't understand the significance of the miracle of the loaves. Their hearts were too hard to take it in. Again, reading amazed here, they, it still wasn't something they could expect. Their expectation didn't match. This isn't a positive amaze. They were amazed like, this isn't happening. This isn't what, how it works. This isn't how any of this works. Their hearts were too hard to take it in. After they had crossed the lake, they landed in Genesaret. Uh, they brought the boat uh, to the shore and climbed out the people recognized Jesus at once. They ran throughout the whole area carrying sick people on mats to wherever uh, they heard he was. Wherever he went in villages, cities, or the countryside, they brought the sick out, of the out to the marketplace. 
They begged him to let the sick touch at least the fringe of his robe, and they all touched him, and all that touched him were healed. Now, all of this, for us today, the truth is the only thing that can disqualify us or keep us from God's service is the same thing that was keeping them from being able to see it. The hardening of our heart. Listen, the disciples still didn't get it. God was doing amazing things with them, to them, and through them. And they still didn't get it. Because their hearts were hard. What does that mean? Their hearts were, they, they had a they had a belief that was so, uh, he asked, what does it mean? Um, he had, they had a belief that was so strong that God's truth ran counter to the belief that was so strong. And they had a choice to choose God's truth or what they believed. And they're like, I just can't let this other thing in. It's like when uh, um, we can be, I can be so mad at somebody and I can look and the, the Bible says, I need to forgive him. And I'll say something like, I know I need to forgive him, but I just can't. That's a hardened heart. I know I ought to do this one thing because the, the teaching says I ought to do it because Jesus told me to, and if he's my Lord, I ought to do what he says, and he's given me this instruction, but I just can't do it. That's a hardened heart, right? They were so much expecting Jesus to be a king or a popular leader, they couldn't see when he was something even more than that. They could see that he would maybe be a, a prophet like Elijah. They couldn't believe that he would be something more than that. They could see him as a prophet like John the Baptist <clears throat> or a great teacher. But they, it was hard for them to see beyond it. They're going to. And praise God, a hardened heart doesn't have to always be hardened. I'm testimony to that. So for us today, what can keep us from being a minister? What can keep me from being a minister is my hardened heart. But you know what? That's one thing I have control of. Today is the day. Even if I failed in the past, today is the day. In a moment, we're going to be taking our offering. And when we do that... Um, that's the time to put those offering, the little comment cards if you have those. Uh, again, General Community Church is what we put on our checks. If you're gonna, if you're a member here and you want to help support the ministry, that's that's what you put down there. Um, uh, but the offering tray is also for those comment cards, those prayer requests. Go ahead and feel free to put that in there. But before we do that, I just uh, before we call it up with a couple people and to 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 do to take the uh, offering trays, I just want to throw this out to you. Listen, uh, I don't know what you've told no, no to God before. I know what I've told no to God about. And today is a day in my prayer. I'm going to say yes. I'm going to lean to God and say yes. You know what? I trust. I'm going to trust you in this. And I, my prayer for you this week is that, that that is what you do as well. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that you found us where we were at. That you called us, even though there's a whole list of reasons why we couldn't or ought not serve you, that you still called us. You called us, and you called us to your ministry, Lord. Lord, surely there were people that were better equipped or better prepared, came from better backgrounds, had better history, better, better whatever it was. But you called us. Lord, there's so many reasons that I, I tell you that I, that I can't serve. Lord, I can't speak. I can't, um, I'm goofy looking. I'm whatever, whatever the thing is, whatever I turn around and say, this is why I can't do this, Lord. I know that ultimately it all comes down to you. You gave people the ability to speak. You gave people the ability to go forth and, and walk and move and, and, and do. Lord, today I'm going to do for you. Give me the strength to make that choice. Lord, today those things that I've told you no or no, I'm too scared to or maybe someday in the future, today I know today is the day to come in. I give that to you. Lord, when I said that you are my Lord, Jesus, I said that you are my boss, today I'm going to live like you are my boss. 
I believe that you died on the cross for me, you were risen from the dead. I believe that. And I know that that means that that power that can bring new life is, is dwelling me as well. And Lord, I give you thanks for that. I thank you for all these things. Give me courage as I step out in faith this week. Give me strength as I go to the harvest. Thank you.